Okay, now I asked God what I should talk to you about because I didn't know who was going to be here and I don't know what your needs may be. And as I began to pray for God to give me direction on what to say, I felt like he told me to preach about him. Now we could preach about a lot of things today. We could preach about the trees and the stars and all that. But what about the one who made everything? I mean, we're, we want to be saved. We want to go to heaven someday. But what are we going to see up there? How are we going to get to know the one that created us? And really, that's where your walk with God begins. So if you take a look at our handout today, the lesson is on this thought, who is God? Uh, now we'll start with verse Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 4, and we'll read this verse. This will be our text verse, and we'll pray and we'll begin. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord, somebody say the Lord. the Lord, our God, that's the subject of this verse. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. Somebody say one. one. So God is one from the very beginning of your Bible. This is in the onset. We are taught that God is one. Uh, and then we go all the way, could skip, we'll talk about it in just a minute, we could skip all the way to the end of your Bible in the book of Revelation, and the Bible shows a picture of the throne room of God. How many want to go to heaven and see the throne room of God? Well, due to, uh, Revelation 4 and 2 talks about that throne room. It's actually at the bottom of your handout, I'm kind of cheating, we're skipping to the bottom, front page, bottom. It says, Revelation 4 and 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Not ten thrones, not a hundred thrones, not two thrones, not three or five or any other number. A throne was set in heaven. And how many sat on that throne? One, One set on the throne. So this is the throne of God. And from the beginning of your Bible... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. All the way to the back of the book, one throne, one sitting on that throne. I'm going to title this today, Who is God? Would you help me pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, mighty God. It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. God, I know that so many of us have our own ideas and concepts, but I'm thankful that the Word of God is true and can settle the score. The Word of God can teach us the truth and help us to know you in all of your facets. We humbly ask for your anointing, not only to teach, but also to hear, to perceive, to understand, to love it, to cherish it. Loose a divine spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and revelation upon every sincere heart in this place today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and bind every hindering spirit in Jesus' name. Somebody said, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So, here's the thing. God knows you. Here's if your head are numbered. But he wants you to know him. And what that means is you need to have the right concept and the right idea of what he is like. Because some people will worship a tree and call it God. Some people will worship the sun God and call that God. Is that God? No. These are things God has created, but God wants you to understand who He is. Okay, and the reason this is important is because when you get to heaven, it, are you going to see a person on that throne? Is it going to be a blob? Is it going to be a, a, a bird like the spirit was descending? Is it, a, is, it a, is it a bird roosting there? Is it a human being looking creature? Is it an angelic being? Is it visible at all? All of these things are things we need to understand. And we've got the answers in our Bible for it. Are you ready for it? All right, let's go right Number one, Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is our foundational verse. The Lord, our God, is one. So, in His core essence, His being, He is not five, three, two, ten, 
a hundred. He is one being. Somebody say one. one. Uh, now you're one being and you play many roles, you know, but you are one individual being and God is the same. Number two, what else do we need to know about God? John 4, 24, God is a spirit. Somebody say spirit. spirit, meaning he is not flesh. He is invisible. Can't see God. The Bible says, your Bible says, no man has seen God at any time. The Bible says in him, in God, his spirit, we move, I'm moving now, we live and we have our being. That means right now, all around us, there's God. David said, where can I go where God is not? If I go to the farthest star, he's there. If I go to the depths of the sea, God is there. David said, even if I went to hell, God is there. I, can, I cannot go anywhere where God does not exist. That's how big God is. If you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to wrap your mind around how big and how powerful God is. The universe, God is not in the universe. If this wall is the universe, this isn't God. This is the universe, and that's God. You understand? They say there are billions of stars in galaxies. Okay, let's say this is a galaxy and there's billions of stars. And then they say there's billions of galaxies. And in one of these galaxies, there's this tiny little dot called Earth where he has created man and it's the only place where he has created life. And the, everything else he's created is for signs and for seasons and for the lighting of the sky. We can look up, well not in Houston because of all the smog, but out in the city we can look up and see the twinkling stars. Kind of like my bling bling folder, amen. And so God is rather big. But number three, Psalm 90 and 2, God is from everlasting, if you go that way and you never stop, to everlasting, thou art God. The Bible teaches he's eternal. You know what that means? He was before time ever existed. You know, time had a beginning. And time has an ending. God was before time and he's after time. Time is just a parenthesis in the mind of God. Before there ever was time, he existed. Here's something cool about God. He never had a beginning. And guess what? He will never have an ending. He says, I am the beginning and the ending. Not the end, y'all, because the end has an end to it. He said, I'm the ending. I keep going. We can't even wrap our mind around something that always was because everything we've ever known has a birth, a beginning, and an ending. Whether it be the tree that began from an acorn or, or the first nail that somebody built that beautiful house, one day it will come down. The tree will fall and it will reproduce and over and over again. But God had no, he was before anything ever was and he always was. And we have we have a three and a half pound brain trying to wrap our mind around that. Good luck. Amen. So God is eternal. He was before time. He's after time. And he's currently living all throughout time. He's in your yesterdays. He's right here now. He's in your tomorrows. That's, the Bible says he calls things that are not as though they were. That means he's already in your future. Sees what you're going to do. Isn't that awesome? Number four, 1 Timothy 3.16. Now this is where it gets interesting because God is holy. God wants to take us to heaven one day when we die to be with him. But because God is holy, he cannot take sin into heaven. He cannot take sin into himself and remain holy. But the problem is we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we can't enter heaven without some kind of plan to wash our sins away, to cover us so that he sees us as pure and holy and can take him into us, or us into him, rather, and still remain holy. 
So, you know, there had to be a plan of redemption. This is the story of Calvary. How many loves the cross, how Jesus came and died for our sins. I'm so very thankful. And, and see, uh, because the Bible teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. This is God's plan, the only way, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because we've sinned, we're worthy to die. And so to wash away our sins, something has to die. But now see, I can't die for you, and you can't die for me, because you're not perfect either. Huh? Right? And so God's looking on the earth to find somebody that's perfect, somebody that's holy, that will give their life for humanity's sins, and he can find none. They are all together gone away backward. There is none that doeth good, the Bible says. No, not one. For all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and come short of the glory of God. So God's in heaven wanting to bring humanity to heaven and be saved one day, knowing they are sinners. And he says, I've got to find some way to redeem them, but there's no human on earth that can do it. So he looks around and he says, well, if you want a job done right, Sometimes you've got to do it yourself. So that great invisible God who could find no perfect human to die for us wrapped himself in flesh and came as a man, bled and died on the cross and rose again. Oh, praise God. Oh, I don't know if I believe that, Brother Smith. We'll go to 1 Timothy, number 4, 316. It's in your Bible. The Bible says God, which is a spirit, was manifest in the flesh or put on humanity. The invisible God became visible to both man and angels. That's why it talks about the, the angels could see him. Amen. Colossians 1 and 15 says, Jesus, the man, the fleshly body of God, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I found it interesting. How many have heard of the 12 disciples, the apostles? When Jesus was in the flesh, they're walking around with him for three and a half years, hanging out, seeing the miracles. And one of them says, Lord, Philip says, show us the Father. He's talking to the man Jesus, show us the Father, the Spirit of God, this invisible spirit. We want to see him. Show us the Father and it'll satisfy us. And Jesus looked at him and said, have I been so long time with you, Philip? And thou hast not known me? He said, this is your Bible. He that hath seen me, seen this flesh, hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Colossians says, or Hebrews 1 and 3, excuse me, Jesus is the image of this invisible God. In other words, the only God your eyes will ever see now or on the other side of heaven is looking into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many Lords? One. But the Bible called God Lord, right? Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord, and God is that Lord. But in the Bible, the New Testament says Jesus is Lord. Huh? If there's only one Lord, how is that God Lord and Jesus Lord if there's only one Lord unless they are one and the same? And I suppose one of the most interesting things that throws people off in their concept of God is this terminology of the, quote, Son of God. Because in our vernacular, if you will, if I say Jeremiah is my son, Jeremiah, this is my son. 
we are talking about another individual, another person that is separate from me. But in the biblical language, when we say Son of God, we're not talking about another person. We're talking about the visible manifestation of God's Spirit in a human body. So, listen to this. Matthew 3.17 says it like this. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We see verses like this. And to some it appears that there is more than one God. But we've got to stick with one. We've got to understand this. We, the very first step was the Lord our God is one. Settled. So what is this terminology, Son of God, talking about? We've established that God's a spirit, it's not flesh, but then we discovered that that God, which is spirit, was in Christ or inside of flesh. So God put on flesh, was manifest in the flesh for one purpose alone, and that was for redemption. He didn't owe you anything, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't fair for him to die. He didn't have to do it. He didn't sin. We owed a debt we could not pay. But thank God he paid a debt he did not owe. Knowing that Jesus is God in the flesh cancels out the idea that Jesus is some other being outside of God. For in him, the Bible says, Colossians 2 and 9. Somebody say, in him. In the man, in the fleshly body of Jesus Christ, in him dwelleth all, the Bible says, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. All of who God is was in the man Christ Jesus. It did not say a portion of God was in Jesus. It did not say 33.33333333 percent of God was in Jesus but all of the fullness of God so we've got to understand these terminologies this, the, let's, let's go ahead therefore the term son must be understood to be speaking of the flesh that God wore not a different person who brought their thinking cap today? Anybody bring your thinking cap? Okay, I thought I'd seen a few. Uh, you tell me if this is love. I have my son Jeremiah, I have me. We're two different beings. Here's a rushing river, and I see a poor soul floating down that river, and there, there over there is a, a drop off. They're going to drown, they're going to die. I gotta save them. This is hypothetical. Hmm. I love you so much, you're fixing to die. Uh, I don't want to jump in there and die and do it. Hey, Junior, I love you so much, I'm going to send this fella to go do it. Go ahead, Junior. Is that love for me to tell my son to go do something and him die? That's not my love. That may be his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We've heard that. How do you make sense of it that he gave? You have to understand the terminology of what the son is. It's not another person. It's the flesh, the only flesh that he wore. He loved the world so much that he, he gave the only flesh that he was born into, that he begot. All right. So, when God says in Matthew 3, 17, well, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's easy to understand it this way. This is my one and only flesh that I have been begotten into. I am pleased with this plan. You know, God came into flesh one time. That's important. You know why? Because somebody can say, well, God's done this before. Jesus wasn't the only, that wasn't the only time God came in flesh. Uh, Buddha was God, and, and Muhammad, and Hare Krishna, and this and that and the other. 
Ladies and gentlemen, God didn't need 10 times to get salvation done. He only needed one human body. Aren't you glad God is not a failure like the devil? He just won and done. Praise God. Amen. God gets the job done. Okay. So what we know about Jesus is that he is God in a body. The image of the invisible God. Now, turn to your next page, if you will. You could study this on your own time. But I want you to study it. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. It's called the wheel of prophecy. And look in the center of this page, one God. Now, if you look to where the O is on the word God and look down, you see a little section that says God is coming. Do you see that? Now, if you follow that up parallel, go back up through the one God and to the other side, it says Jesus is coming. Does that make sense? And let's go to the right. God is coming. We'll go to the right one. It says God is the rock. This is the Old Testament, of course. Follow that up across to the other side. And it says Jesus is the rock. Now, this is Old Testament and New Testament, and you're going to get the picture after you begin to study it. But the Old Testament says that God's coming, and the New Testament says Jesus is coming. Old Testament says that God is the rock, Jesus is the rock in the New Testament. Old Testament, God said, I am the first and the last. New Testament, Jesus said, I am the first and the last. The Bible says that God is the king. The Bible says Jesus is the king. The Bible says God is the shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. The Bible says God is the redeemer and savior. New Testament says Jesus is the redeemer and savior. Old Testament says God is the creator, created all things. New Testament, Jesus is the creator. Are you getting the picture? Jesus is not a different individual. He is the almighty God wrapped in human flesh for the purpose of redemption. If you're thankful God came and bled and died for you, would you just give the Lord some praise in the house? Now, this will bring questions, no doubt. That's okay. I understand that confusion will hit some people's minds. And I will say this, there are some people that will never see truth, Pastor. Never see it. And it cannot bother you, and it can't bother me. All we can do is preach, and, uh, you know, it's like casting out seeds. Some seed's going to land on good ground, some's going to land on thorny ground, some's going to land on rocky soil. Sometimes it'll, it'll be planted for a little while, and the, the cares of life will choke things out. All we can do is preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. And the Bible says if the gospel, the truth of this message, if the gospel is, can anybody quote it? Hidden. It is hid to them that are lost. So if nothing I say makes sense to you today, and there's just a big question mark, well, go back and check your sincerity level, and why you're here, and where you are with God, because if the gospel it is, is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I don't know how you feel about it, but I love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I want to know Him. I want to cherish this truth, and I'm not going to argue with His Word. I'm going to figure out what this Word says, but I'm certainly not going to argue with it. Okay, now we've got this understanding that the Spirit of God is invisible, fills all time and space. It's massive, but God became a man. He put on human flesh for the purpose of redemption. And we hear terminology, I think this is what throws people off about who God is and how many he is and what they're going to see in heaven. Because we hear in your Bible terminology like Father and Son and Spirit. And it appears to, to imply three. But Spirit is one thing. The flesh, we know the Spirit was in flesh. But what about this Holy Ghost business? Now this is the next page if you'll turn it to... Now, I'm sorry about this little character picture. I can't draw and I couldn't draw. I mean, I just picked this picture off the internet. I hope uh, that's a good looking Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, if it don't look good. But anyway, it says only for 
educational purposes, you understand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, praise God. Well, I try. I, I try. You know, brother. I try. Okay. And look at the top. You see that cloud? I know God may not look like a cloud, but for the sake of being no shape, no form, and big, that's God. That's the Spirit. That's the Father, right? Let's read it together. You don't have to read it out loud, but it says, God is one, as we've learned, undivided spirit being. He's invisible. He's eternal. No beginning, no ending, measureless, omnipresent, everywhere present, nowhere absent, omniscient, he knows everything, omnipotent, uh, omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's the creator of all things, he is not a co equal trinity. We call this being the Father. Somebody say Father. Father. One. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, not three, not ten, one. That's what your Bible says, one. Okay. Now, when Jesus comes on the earth, what is he? What is it? Is it another individual, a different spirit? Look at the little arrow. It says the incarnation, the only begotten flesh, son, flesh of God. So in Jesus, you see where it says God? It's kind of depicting that God's spirit is in the man. He says, hi, I'm Jesus. The term son simply refers to the flesh of God. So the Son, Jesus, is God in the flesh. The Father became flesh. The same undivided spirit we call Father, born in the flesh. The Bible teaches that God was in Christ. That's the Bible verse. He was in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself. All right? God was in Christ. Not a third of God. But all the fullness of the Godhead was in him. Now, that does not mean the Spirit of God ceased filling the universe. He always did. It just means Jesus Christ was the representative of everything God was in a human body. It was his headquarters, so to speak. Very temporary in the flesh, 33 years, as they say. But now look, this Spirit of God that came into the man Jesus wants to dwell in you. Maybe you remember the disciples as they were hanging out with Jesus right before he left, Pastor. He looked at his disciples. He said, right now in the flesh, I'm with you. But it's needful for me to go away in the flesh. You're not going to see me anymore. Because I'm with you now, but I shall be in you. Now, if you don't mind standing, brother, I'm trying not to knock you over. I know I'm a heavy. But if, <laughs> don't you just love it when you get volunteered? You look like you're a healthy shape fit. That's right. Now, if I tried to bump into you, yeah. I, I shall be in you. We can't do that in the flesh, can no, we? we okay, thank you. Can we give Pastor a hand? He did a great job. God bless you, Pastor. We got to pray for his shoulder for healing before we leave. But it was for a good cause. Jesus said, I'm with you in the flesh, but I'm going to be inside of you. So he wasn't talking about the spirit, I mean, in the flesh. He was talking, I'm going to be inside of you in the spirit. How about this verse? Where two or three are gathered together in my name. What name? Name of Jesus. So Jesus was talking. There am I in the midst. How many gathered together in his name today? Yes, we did. So that means Jesus is in our midst. Do you see him in the flesh? Oh, so the Spirit of God is Jesus. Oh. Mm. Jesus said, I shall be in you. And look at this picture, this woman receiving the Holy Ghost. Huh? I like that. That's a good picture. Notice it's God on the inside. It's that same spirit that was in Jesus that's in her. The Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead, that was God's spirit that was in Christ, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal, mortal body. He will resurrect you on the day of the rapture. 
But you've got to have his spirit in you, which is, we call, the Holy Ghost. Now, that's not another spirit. It's his spirit. Right. Now, put on your thinking cap again. Let's think about this. Why do we even call it the Holy Spirit? Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit is a synonymous terms. Why do we call it Holy Spirit? Ah, good question. God is a spirit, huh? and God is holy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not another spirit, it's God's Holy Spirit, His Spirit that is holy. It's not another third of God sliced off and that's what you got. And another third was over here and He was in the flesh and the other third was left up there in heaven. How can we prove it? Wonderful, I'm glad you asked. Jesus in the flesh. Am I boring you guys? Okay. He said this, all power. Somebody say all power. That means power to create heavens and earth, heal the sick, raise the dead, send people to heaven, send people to hell. All power, raise the dead, walk on the water. All power, Jesus said, as a man in the flesh, is given unto me. Now, wait a minute. If there were three different beings, and there's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they're different. If Jesus has got all the power, then the Father is powerless, and the Holy Ghost is powerless. And the Holy Ghost we know ain't powerless because it heals people, delivers people, set them free, praise God, cast out devils. Huh? We know the Father ain't powerless. He spoke the worlds into existence. Let it be. Boom! And the world was created. So what's Jesus saying? I am God in the flesh. All power is given on to me. Can we give the Lord a great big hand of praise because we serve a powerful God. Now, I'm almost done. Somebody say thank God. <laughs> I challenge you to go home and read the book of Isaiah. Huh? And get anything more than one God out of it. Because, and this is why this is so important, ladies and gentlemen. People call God three all the time. The terminology, and people probably don't mean it. They don't even understand what they're doing, really, a lot of them. God is a trinity. Here, they say, you know, that God is a trinity. What, is, what does trinity mean? It's the root word tri. What does tri mean? When you're riding a bike and it's a tricycle, how many wheels has it got? You see a dinosaur and it's called a triceratops, how many horns does it got? If you have a god and you call him a trinity, how many gods you got? Huh. But here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And, and we call, or not we, but a lot of people in the Christian world call Jesus holy trinity. But, but what does the Bible say? I'm not interested in tradition. I'm not interested in what that church says or that preacher down the road says. Or, and I'm not here to just bust up traditions and, and make everybody out to be bad guys. I'm just saying the concept of who God is has got to be correct. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But Isaiah never says God is holy three. He says he's holy one. In fact, I'm just going to read a few verses. And maybe, I don't know if you want to jot these verses down or just read Isaiah in your own time. But Isaiah 40, verse 25 says, to whom, God speaking through the prophet, to whom will ye liken me and make me equal, saith the Holy One. Not Holy Three, not Holy A Hundred, not Holy Two, ho not Holy Trinity, Holy One of Israel. Now the Trinity says that there's three and they're co-equal. Huh? You ever heard that? Co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, co-equal. God said, who are you going to liken me and make me equal to? I have no equal. Mm. All right, uh, Isaiah 41, verse 14, fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Go to next uh, verse 16. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the holy, how many? One, One of Israel. Verse 20. 
that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, the Holy One, Holy One. Are you getting the picture today? Holy One of Israel. All right. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 43, verse 3. For I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the Savior. He is because they're not two different people. It's the same spirit. Verse 11, same chapter 43. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Right. Oh, but Jesus is the Savior. And he's standing at the right hand of God. Well, that's what the New Testament says, but you've got to understand terminology. Right hand of God doesn't mean I'm standing right next to somebody. Right hand of God means exercising all the power of God. Now let's understand this verse with the proper meaning. Jesus is exercising all of the power of God. Amen, amen. It's a one God verse is what it is. Isaiah 43 verse 14. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Verse 25, 43 and 25. I, even I am He that blotteth out thy transgressions. Isn't that what Jesus did? For mine own sake, and I will remember thy sins no more. Verse, uh, chapter 44 and 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his re Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Verse 8, is there a God beside me? Oh, yea, there is no God. I know not any. If you know more of, than one God, you know more than God knows. He said, I'm up here in heaven. I'm looking around. I don't see anybody but me. My, my. And on and on. I, I could, there's probably a thousand here. I'm not going to. Waste all of your time. I know your time is valuable. But here's the deal with all of this. Jesus said in John 8, 24, and I'm closing. You know, preachers always say that about 10 times, don't you? You know good and will they ain't close. But I'm trying to close. John 8, 24. This is why this is so important. Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. Now there's no period there. That means we're not done with this discussion. But let me just say when Jesus says something like you're going to die in your sins. You're going to be lost forever. You're going to, that means you're going to burn in hell and no escape, no hope. When God says something like that, my ears perk up, my little antenna. Okay, what is he about to say? This verse is very important. For if ye believe not that I am he, that God of the Old Testament in flesh, ye shall die in your sins. Now, does anybody have a physical Bible today? Anybody got a, a King James version by chance? Is it King James? Okay, anybody got a Bible at all that's physical? You got one? Now, I'm just curious, John 8, 24 I can even flip there for you. I'm just curious because some Bibles will do this and some will not. You know, John 8, 24. I don't know if this is going to do it, but most Bibles, a lot of times, will have words in italics that were not in the original text. Everybody ever, anybody ever noticed that before? So I'm over at Texas Bible College, Excel. I'm a Bible school teacher. There's some things I've learned about Hebrew and Greek. In your Bible, if you ever have your physical Bible and you see a word and it's like italic sideways, that means that word was not there in the original Greek text. Okay? Why is that important? Because this verse has one word that was not there in the original Greek text. It was added by the translators to help make sense of the verse in your mind based on their understanding. Only problem with that, the people that translated it had a concept that God was not one, but that he was three. And they were trying to make sense of this verse. And they put in this word, he, because they were trying to make it mean the Messiah. 
But let's read this verse the way it was originally in the Greek. John 8, 24. Jesus talking. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am. Huh? Does anybody know who the I am is? Well, go back to the Old Testament. When Moses was talking to a burning bush, God speaks to him and says, you go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses said, I'll go, but I got to know your name because they're going to ask me what God, who, who sent you, who t is telling me to do this? And God said to Moses, you tell them, this is what my name is, you tell them this, I am sent you. The God of the Old Testament says, I am the I am. Jesus came on the scene and said, I am that I am. And if you don't believe that I'm the God of the Old Testament, you don't have a proper understanding of who I am. So when you get to heaven, you're not going to see three thrones. One is an elder gray-haired man. On the other is a younger man. And the other here is Roost the Bird, the spirit. Your Bible says one throne, one set on that throne. And your eyes are only going to be able to see one thing sitting on that throne. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in closing, let me just ask you a quick question. Closing number two. Have you ever heard of the, anybody calling the devil a trinity? What? Why not? Why not? I mean, and this is true. The scriptures actually call Satan a father, a son, and a spirit. Did you know that? He's called the father of lies, the son of perdition, and that evil spirit. Father, son, and spirit. That's what the devil's called. But nobody gets him confused, pastor. Nobody ever thinks the devil has three persons. Nobody ever preached and there's three in the devil head. Huh? Why? Nobody's ever saying that they're co-equal or co-eternal. Nobody's ever said the son of perdition is sitting at the right hand of the father of lies. Huh? Why? Because God always tells the truth about the devil, but the devil always tells lies about God. Oh, yeah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Even the devils believe in one, Pastor. James 2 and 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe it. The devil knows there's one God. And he just don't want you to believe it. Because if you believe it, you might be saved. But if you believe that he's two or three or a hundred or this tree or that over there and this, and you've got a concept of all these, you cannot be saved. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am the God of the Old Testament, you will die in your sins. But if you know there is one God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He created all things and it is he who is our Savior. He came in flesh. He died and rose again on the third day and he is coming back back again. He's alive forevermore. Let's stand. Praise God. I don't know how you feel about it, but I love this glorious truth. I love it. I cherish it. I love it. The Bible says you've got to love this truth. The Bible teaches if you don't love it, it's very important what you do with this message today. Some will reject it. Some will mock it. Some will say it's not so. Some will never see the truth of it because they're lost or they're not really sincere. But the fact is, if you do see it today, you got to be careful with what you do with it. Because the Bible says that God will send a strong delusion, a strong delusion upon those who have not a love for this truth. That they would believe a lie and be lost. Why would God send a strong delusion to somebody? Well, because he gave everything for this message. Yes. He didn't have to get off his throne in glory. He didn't have to wrap himself in flesh. He didn't owe us one thing. But he bled and he died. 
We're talking about the king of glory who created everything. He's in a flesh form, allowing things to tempt him and try him. He's sitting on the throne, and then he gets on the cross, and they've stripped him naked, and they've beat him bloodied and put him on that cross. And you think, you think that doesn't matter? That is everything. Jesus said, if you don't love it, if you don't appreciate what I did, then I will let you believe something else. Whatever you want to believe, you'll believe that, but you won't believe this. I don't know how you feel, but I cherish, I cherish this glorious truth. Mm.